It's great to see you this morning. How's everybody? We good? Grab your Bible. Uh, we'll get there here in just a moment. I got a big question for us as we start our time together. Uh, what is the story that you're living out? Or how about this? What big story are you, are you living in? Because, and I know we don't really think about this all the time, but to set our time up for this new series we're entering into, you're living out a story. You're living inside a story. And as Christians, uh, we live out the big, grand meta-narrative, if you will, of, of Scripture. We see it in the Bible. We talk about this all the time. Uh, here, we talk about in our pastor study how to really understand the Scriptures. And it's basically this. Some of you could kind of track with me here. It's creation, right? Fall, redemption, and restoration. I mean, that's a way to break it down. We were created by God in His image. Sin has individually and corporately turned us away from him. We've pulled away from him. We need rescue. And so Christ comes and he rescues us, redeems us by his life and death on the cross. He's raised again so that we might be restored. He enters into this, uh, guides us into restoration and he's restoring all things. And that's where all of history is heading. Now, this is not a small thing because not everyone lives out that story. This past week, we um, had the, the privilege, the honor to come alongside a precious family in our church. Many of you know Elena Rogers uh, Johnson, who passed away, and we had her service on Friday and gathered around uh, her, the family. Brian and Kathy Rogers, her parents, are, uh, are here in our church. The, all the kids grew up here. But uh, it's left behind Russell and two little children. And to be there and to praise the Lord in the midst of such grief and loss. And then to hear Kathy, hear mom step up and proclaim the goodness of God. That he is at work, he's sovereign. And her message was so explicit. She wanted everyone to know that God loves you. That Elena's life mattered, that she is now with him and God loves every person in the room. There's only one way you can stand in that moment with hope and grieve with hope and praise God and say he's still good. And it's if you understand that biblical narrative, if you're living that out, right? I've been following uh, the rise and fall of what has become known as the, uh, the new atheists. Um, and, and just hang with me for a moment. But some of you will know some names like Sam Harris or Christopher Hitchens, um, Richard Dawkins. There's others who've been trying to convince us for about 10, 15 years and beyond. This is not new, that there is no God. Of course, what they, what they discover and why I say the rise and, and the fall of, we're seeing a resurgence now of believers entering into that space, even atheists themselves noting what every atheist has ever figured out, which is without God, there is no purpose in life. There is no grander story. You were not created by God. There is no fall. There's no sin. There's no right or wrong because there's no ultimate good. And what happens is every atheist comes to what every thinking person would come to, and that is despair. Life makes no sense, right? We as Christians know that it does because of the grander narrative we find ourselves in. Uh, in fact, uh, Tom Holland, who's an atheist uh, historian, he wrote an article called Why I Was Wrong About Christianity. And he doesn't mean, well, now I'm a believer. But what he means is, as a historian, he says, I used to think we were Greco-Roman uh, influence of the Enlightenment and all the things he says. But actually, Christianity has framed everything and changed the entire world, particularly in the global West. And he says, in essence, he, he writes this, I have learned to accept that I'm not Greek or Roman at all, but thoroughly and proudly Christian. He's like Douglas Murray, who's another secular thinker who calls himself a Christian atheist. Meaning, essentially, we're all Christians. I mean, we all live in a framework of Christianity. Whether you like it or not, everything that the atheist loves about living in the United States, places like this, it, he owes it all to the Judeo-Christian ethic 
and the grander story. But what's interesting here is some of you know the name Jordan Peterson, who comes at it from a psychological standpoint. Some of these um, public intellectuals are now embracing the fact that Christianity has radically changed the world. But what they will say is it's metaphorically true, but not literally true. Meaning, it's a great story. And wow, this whole idea of, of dying to yourself and living for others and the sanctity of... I mean, think about it. This is where all these historians go. Where does, where does human rights come from if there's no God? Christianity. Where does it say that... that who comes this idea that every life is sacred? Every life. Every person matters. The Bible, right? How is it that we would care for the poor, try to raise up others? All of these are distinctly Christian, um, Judeo-Christian values and ethics. And I say all that because many of them, I, I see Jordan Peterson is kind of on this, this track of like, he's almost there. Like what you realize is you can't just say it's metaphorically true if it's not literally true. And so I'm going with Paul who said, if Christ is not resurrected, if he was not crucified, resurrected, we're still dead in our sin and life makes no sense at all. See, there's a couple of problems with that kind of thinking. Not just a great narrative, not just a wonderful mythical story, but Christ has literally lived historically, we can track that, that he died on the cross and everything that is Judeo-Christian in the end comes directly from him, from his mouth, but even more so from his life, his death and his resurrection. Apart from the resurrection, there is, he's not Lord of all. There is no God of the Bible and we're living meaningless lives. This is where this heads. But the other part that we're going to talk about here today and in the days to come is, as Christians, we follow a person, literally follow a person who's revealed himself to us in the person of Jesus, literally, historically, explicitly. And so the big question, all this to say, what story are you living in? Big reminder today, who are you following? Because we're all following someone. We think of spiritual formation as something that, you know, Christian thing. You're being, everyone is being formed spiritually by something because we can't but worship something or someone. Jesus said it this way, Matthew 6, 21. Wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. Whatever you treasure the most is where your heart runs. Whatever you value the most in life, that's where your energies, your thoughts, you say, well, how would I know? What do you think about? What makes you anxious that you might lose it? I mean, it takes some deep, a deep dive, but what are you pursuing above everything else? Because we're all pursuing something or someone. And as we launch into this series, we're calling it uh, Encountering Jesus. And so now until Easter Sunday, we launched from this past Ash Wednesday, this Wednesday night, uh, we're entering now into this season, as Cassidy noted, of, of sacrifice, of restraint, and of, of giving of ourselves to the Lord, and, and spending time in prayer, changing your habits. We're going to talk a bit about that today. But we're going to look at uh, a point in the book of Luke. All the, all the passages we look at are going to be out of the book of Luke. But in Luke chapter 9, verse 51, I'm setting this up, okay? It says, when the days drew near for him to be taken up, okay, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. This is a pivotal moment in, uh, in the book of Luke. This changes the direction. You can see it there. He he's now turns his face, his heart toward Jerusalem. For the last time, he's heading to the cross is what this means. Uh, Luke has 24 chapters. This is chapter nine. So we're going to walk with him to the cross. We're going to follow Jesus to the cross and we're going to see who he encounters along the way and see how we're much like, like them. In fact, we're going to hear stories from our people um, who are like those or who have encountered Jesus in the same way. So turn to Luke chapter nine, all that to say, 
Um, the big question, what story you're living, who are you following? And we're going to look at this today. This is the explicit call for every one of us to be a disciple of Jesus. Luke chapter nine, verse 21 through 27. Now, again, always critical, the context that we're looking at here. Jesus has asked his disciples, you might know this famous moment. He gathers them in. He says, hey, a lot of people are talking about me, saying this or that. Who do you say I am? Not because he was concerned about what everybody's thinking about him, but instead, who did, what, what have you guys come to see? And Peter, in a, mo- a rare moment, a ra- rare moment of brilliance, right, and clarity, he says, you're the Messiah. That's who you are. You're the liberating king. Like, this is a big deal. You're Christ. Uh, that's, that's the word Messiah in the Greek. You're the one. And Jesus, you know, he says, you're exactly right. And on this truth, what you just said, on me, what you said about me, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And then he lays out this, um, what I'm going to call unexpected purpose. Every week we're looking at something unexpected that we did not anticipate when we encountered Jesus. And today we're going to talk about, if you're taking notes on sermons here, three stages of being a disciple. Okay. Now this is not exactly linear, but this, I'm going to, I want to ask you, here it is. Where do you find yourself in this kind of three stage process? The first one is to respond to Jesus. Okay. That's the first one. The second one is to follow Jesus. And the third is to become like Jesus. All right. If you're a guest or you're still trying to figure out this whole Christian thing, we're all on a journey together. But today's a great day. What does it mean to really be a Christian is what we're talking about. First, we're going to respond to Jesus. Okay, that's the first thing. Jesus issues an invitation is what we see here. Um, But it's all about something that has already happened. Okay, he calls us and now has already happened. Look at this in verse 21. And he strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to no one. What Peter has said, you're the Messiah. Okay, that, okay. Saying the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. <laughs> I don't know how they received that, but Jesus is saying this is exactly what's gonna happen. Uh, you've seen in other places in scripture, perhaps you've, you've read where he says, Things like, hey, don't, uh, don't tell anyone, my time has not yet come. Um, and this is the case here. But I think it's also the case that he's saying, um, you don't know exactly what kind of Messiah I am. I mean, he's saying to Peter, uh, you're right, you use the title Messiah, but it's not unlike um, in The Princess Bride, okay, the classic movie, um, I mean, it's some 30 years ago, kids, but it's, it's worth watching. Vizzini is um, the, kind of the sidekick. He's, he's super smart, but he, he keeps on saying, um, you, you remember this? Anybody? Inconceivable is what he says. Something like that. And he keeps on saying it. And then Inigo Montoya, he, he says to him, I, I don't think that word means what you think it means. Because um, he keeps on saying it in places where it doesn't quite fit, right? Peter. I think you don't know what that word means. And so in part, I think Jesus is saying, my time's not yet come. I'm about to be you know, crucified is what he's saying. But he's also saying, don't, not, don't tell anyone because you, you don't get it yet. Like it'd be better if you just don't use that term, Messiah, because you don't fully understand what we're talking about. And this is a good word for us today, friends. Uh, we've got to know the real Jesus, Right. If we're going to be clear about who God is, we need to see him clearly for who he is. We don't look at Muhammad to figure out who God is. Distinctly Christian. We don't look at Buddha to figure out who God is. We don't look at Moses. We look at Jesus, and so we must be clear about who he is. The historical, real, literal Jesus. Not a mythical you know, character out there who's framing a story for us, but the real thing. And this is where we get it wrong. Uh, And we often treat him like he's a genie in the bottle, not the real Jesus, the American Jesus, my spiritual concierge. He's not that for you. He, he, he's not your life coach. He is Lord of all, or he's not Lord at all. And he's saying to us today, he's speaking into our hearts, get it right. Who do you say he is? Is he Lord of your life? 
And this is the call for every one of us. So what are we responding to? Who are we responding to? We're responding to the one who has now, yes, lived the perfect life for us because we couldn't, died on the cross for our sin, taking upon himself our punishment. He became sin for us so that we would be completely forgiven, that we would not be punished or the target of God's wrath. He becomes that for us as our substitute. He's buried, dead. He's raised up into new life. This is what we're responding to. So we respond to what he's already accomplished. All the Christian life, we say it all the time, is in response to him and what he's done. So we can't miss that. But secondly, then we follow Jesus, all right? Secondly, we follow him. We respond and decide to follow him. Look at verse 23. Here it is, here it is. And he said to to them all, if anyone, now I get a picture of he's talking to the disciples. Then he says to everyone who's there. Everyone, if anyone, this is radical, not just Jews or not just the select chosen people. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself herself and take up his, her cross daily and follow me. This is the high price, the call of discipleship. We need to be clear about this uh, because this is a, this is like the worst sales pitch ever, right? Who wants to follow me? Come die to yourself. Now, come on. Who's up for that? Let's go. Because it's not a sales pitch. It's a call into life, right? And the great tragedy in the church today is that we can claim to be Christian and not be a disciple of Jesus. See, what we see in the Bible, the word Christian is used three times in derogatory terms every single time. The word disciple is used 261 times to describe God's people. We often describe ourselves as brothers and sisters, as saints in the scriptures, see holy ones, you see people of the way. But it's possible in our day to identify as a Christian and not be an apprentice, a disciple of Jesus. So the New Testament is very clear about this. We have flipped it. We talk about being Christian and we all know that word has been misused. In fact, uh, studies show us that 71% of all Americans claim to be Christian. But when you get underneath, Barna has done research here, about 9% actually have a biblical worldview. I mean, like denying things like the resurrection. Oh, I'm a Christian, you know, like, like others. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, an, I'm a Christian atheist. You don't believe in him at all, but we're, you know I'm, I'm Christian because I'm American. And, and we, we know this is the case. In fact, other studies show that 4% of all who claim to be Christian are actually practicing the way of Jesus. This should cause all of us to wonder, am I one of those? Because that's a small percentage. We're going to talk about how might I know. Because the big problem that we have in our culture today is there's a gap between the first century and us, right? We know this. It's why, it's why it's important to understand how to read the Bible. So what we talk about at our pastor study every Wednesday night is how do you faithfully read the word of God? And, and so the first century folks who are listening to him in the text, they're hearing him. And when he says, as a rabbi, come and follow me, like hi halai was the call of a disciple that says, come and follow me. They knew exactly what he's talking about. We use the word maybe student or um, learner, you know, disciple. Where else do we use that word? Because it's not really an American phenomenon. When we think of students, we think of a row and a download of content. Drop a bunch of knowledge if you know these things. That's not what a disciple is. Uh, apprentice is, is a good word. John Mark Comer, among others, say, you know, that's probably the best is to be an apprentice under Jesus. But when a rabbi called disciples, okay, mathetes is the, is the Greek word. The Hebrew word is Talmud, and a Talmudin is a group of Talmuds who would follow after the rabbi. And it wasn't simply to know everything he knows. It was to live like him. It was to do exactly what the rabbi would do. 
So it's a way of life. And this is the same way. Again, first century hearers would have, would have known this. We have a gap. And so here's the question again. You are being discipled by someone. Who is it? Who is guiding you? Because listen, if it's not Jesus, there are plenty of people out there who are vying for your time, social media, wherever else, you know, all over the place who want to disciple you. In fact, they, they want you to subscribe to their way of life. If you do this, then you're going to have a better life. If you practice these things, then you're going to end up like this. You know, if you eat like me, you're going to be jacked like I am, you know, and you're like, nah, genetically, I'll never get there, but, uh, but thanks. And I'll give you a lot of money because you're, I'm going to be a disciple under you and I'm an apprentice under you. We're all doing it. And, and, and so the big question we've got to wrestle with today, who or what is it that's guiding you? And I'd say it this way, show me your habits and I'll show you who you are becoming. Because you see, the way of Jesus, the word is hodos in the, in the Greek, in the, in the New Testament. There's a way. It's why we were called the people of the way. There's a way of life that's radically different from the rest of the world. And it has to do with habits. It has to do with imitating Jesus and following him. We respond to him. We follow him. But because the defining trait in America is one of a radical individualism. We value, listen to this, we value innovation over imitation. In fact, the mantra of our day is, you do you, and you do you. Wow, that's not at all like you, but you do you. And just do you, be you. There's no authority outside of yourself. Just kind of live your life. But the Christian life is to imitate one person. We have a very explicit code of conduct. It is to live exactly like Jesus. Again, it's possible in our day. And it is the tragedy of the American church to say that you can be Christian, identify as Christian, and not be a disciple of Jesus Christ. This is our problem. This is what's stunning our witness and, and showing the world something that Jesus never intended. In fact, in the screw tape letters, some of you have read this book by C.S. Lewis. It's where demons are assigned to other demons. And, um, and screw tape is the main demon who's, who's uh, and, uh, his apprentice under him. Anybody know? It's Wormwood. And it's, a, it's writing letters back and forth to each other. Well, Wormwood lets screw tape know that one of his patients, they call him, um, because every demon is assigned to a person and... Uh, he says that one of them has become a Christian. So he writes Wormwood back and he says, Dear Wormwood, I note with grave displeasure that, you, that your patient has become a Christian. Do not indulge the hope that you will escape the usual penalties and punishment. Yikes. And then he goes on. He says, But there's no need to despair. Hundreds of these adult converts have done so. And he says, and essentially, but they're not a concern for us now, not anymore. Because, listen to this, all the habits of the patient, both mental and bodily, are still in our favor. Meaning, if you don't change your habits, you're not going to change. This is what many of you are experiencing in your, in your Christian life. I came to Jesus I love him. I really do. I mean, I can sing these songs. I love singing. I want to live for Jesus. But you have not changed your habits to be spiritually formed like him. To become like Jesus. We talk about what would Jesus do? You can't do in the moment what he would do if you're not living a comprehensive life that looks like his life. What did he do? He spent a lot of time with the Father. The Son of God spent a lot of time in prayer. How about you? No, I'm good. I mean, I pray quick, but I'm, I'm off. I'm good. Mm, off with your own habits. No wonder you're not seeing a lot of life transformation. He decided daily, uh, I'm going to give myself away every minute. That's how he lived. I'm going I'm to give my life away. If you don't change your habits and be intentional, you will not be formed into the image of Christ. 
And so we'll, we'll continue to unpack this. What, what might this look like? Well, we respond to him first. That's important. This is not, I better, you know, pull myself up by my own bootstraps and through Lent, I'm going to really try because you could be asking the question, is this works righteousness? Is that what this is? No, it's in response to what he's done. That's key. Then it's a determination to follow Jesus. It was uh, Dallas Willard who said, Christians must decide to become disciples in America. That's our big problem. Have you decided? We respond, we follow, and then finally we become like Jesus. How do we do this? We treasure him above all else. Look at what he says in verse 24. Now note, this is not a command. Before he gets to a question, this is a statement of fact is what he's given us. Verse 24. He just said, this is the way it goes. Whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Facts. If you want to hold on to all of your life and just be the Lord of your life, you're going to lose it. But if you just release your life to him, you're going to gain everything. Look at this. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits his soul? And my, 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 how we have seen that. And all of us in varying degrees. Chasing after the stuff of this world while everything that really matters in life is being left behind. The most important relationships we have, the things that matter most that really bring life and eternity to others. There's a completely new affection and a radical shift, a reality of living in the kingdom of God. Jesus is saying, listen, long-term gain it is worth the short-term loss. And because Jesus is perfect theology embodied, think about this. In him, the way of the cross, and we're talking about a story that we live out. He has already said, you're going to deny yourself. You're going to take up your cross. This is fascinating. In our culture today, some of you are wearing crosses, the most identified you know, symbol of any religion on the planet. But taking up your cross is not, oh, I got a burden. I got to carry my cross today. I go without coffee for, for several hours. I didn't get my, you know, that's not what it is. To take up your cross meant to die. That's all it meant. Die to yourself and follow him. So if the cruciform life, the, cr the cross-shaped life is the life of a disciple, then Christ on the cross the suffering, this disfigured man, literally dying a criminal's death, is God doing his best work in disguise. And this is what plays out in our lives. It stands to reason then, right? That that image, that reality should be the way that we live. And this is so contrary to how we want to live. But this is so beautifully, how about explicitly expressed in his teaching in the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount, and so beautifully expressed through his life and his death on the cross, that actually the way of self-denial, the way of enemy love, really does change the world. And Christ is calling us to this, to live exactly like him. And so he put it succinctly, deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow him. What does this mean for you today? What habits do you need to place into your life? Are you in the word? Are you praying? Are you accountable to someone else? Are you even in Christian community? Oh, I know Christians. I'm going to come here. I know people around here. I'm no, 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 no. Do you really know other believers and are you in a rhythm of doing life with them? We call it connect groups here. Are you in a group? Are you truly being intentional? Are you present? Talk to one of our members uh, earlier who is going through a really hard time in life, but she said, I, but I had to come, I had to be here. And it takes courage sometimes. But that's the Christian life, to follow him. And this is how we find real life. Look at verse 26. For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words... Of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Now, what is up with this? So like, I don't want Jesus to be ashamed of me. He's saying, well, it's not a half-hearted commitment. No one can serve two masters. 
I mean, think about it this way. I, I could say it this way. Again, he's either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. He's like your spiritual concierge. Or you let him, or oh, you can have this part of my life, but not this part of my life. It's like the guy who said when he was baptized, you know, he, he, he held his, his wallet up, you know, and then he dunked. Like, okay, well, I'm good. Woo! Didn't baptize that. Not, not the way I spend my money. Don't touch that. But you can have this other stuff in my life. And instead, the Lord says, I want all of you. I want all of you. I mean, think about it this way. What got the apostles killed? Every one of them, minus Judas, well, killed himself. John dies in, in exile. They were all martyrs. What got him killed? What got Jesus killed? It wasn't because he was talking about love, being kind to each other. It was his exclusive claim to divinity. It was his exclusive claim. The claim to exclusivity is what got him killed. And in the same way, our passion and commitment to the exclusive nature of Jesus alone, alone saves us. He alone is Lord of my life. This was the proclamation that gets you killed in the first century. Caesar is not king. Jesus is king of my life. I have no other king but Jesus. And for us to live that way, then he will not be ashamed of us. See, I'm not ashamed of him. Where is it in your life? Maybe you're ashamed. Does anybody at your workplace know that you're a believer? Anybody in your school? See, we, we live our lives and we live for Jesus. And that should be seen and known. So look at verse 27. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Jesus came to usher in the kingdom of God. And the transfiguration is about to happen. He's going to go to the cross. I think that it means the resurrection. But I think he's already saying the kingdom of God, he says, is among you. Yeah, we're here. It's happening right now. The kingdom, the vertical invasion of Jesus into the world, the kingdom of God now has shown up. And it's happening. And he is now restoring all things, starting with, with us. In his classic book, The Cost of Discipleship, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, when God calls a man, when Christ calls a man or a woman, he bids them come and die. So we step into this, and from the front end, Jesus says, here's what it's going to cost you. Satan works the opposite. Satan says, come on, here's what you're going to get immediately. Here's what you get right now. Here's how you're going to feel better. This will bring you pleasure. Here you go. And he will never tell you what's going to happen on the other end of it. It will destroy you. Jesus says at the front end, die to yourself. You're going to die at the other end if you go that route. But die now, and you will have life. So it takes everything in us to believe this, but here's my challenge for us. I think you've heard it. Friends, you gotta change your, how are you gonna change your habits? And the Lenten season is a great time to do this. What habits do you need to change in order to change your life? Because, it, back, to, back to screw tape letters, um, you can get saved, you can make a decision, you can say a prayer, you can come forward, whatever else. If you don't change your habits, nothing's gonna change. What's driving you to change your habits? What he has accomplished for you? Our motivations are completely shift. The calling of Jesus is to change the way that you're living. And it's a rule of life, right? It's to imitate Jesus. And again, we value innovation over imitation. But to imitate him, here's what it is. To get up tomorrow and to be in his word, to pray, to say, today I died to myself, I'm going to live for you. You get up and, no, you do it then later in the afternoon. You, you determine that again. You, you, at night before you are heading home or whatever, you get up the next day and you do it again. You, you get up, you follow Jesus, you do it again the next day and you follow him and you follow him again and you keep following him. That's what you do. That's the Christian life, right? To become like Jesus is possible, but it's got to be intentional. So we're going to close our time together with this song. I'm going to bring, it, bring a challenge and then... We're going to hear a reprise of the song we learned earlier, and we're going to just proclaim it to the Lord as we continue to learn this song together before we go. But you've heard it, friends. Listen, respond to Jesus. Where are you in this? Have you responded to him? Have you decided to follow him, really? To change your habits, change your lifestyle, change the way you spend your money, to change the way that you spend your time. And, and, and are you becoming like Jesus? I'd say it this way. Is the passion of your life, the number one passion, of your life to become like Jesus? Is it? And would others see that in your life? 
Because here's the thing. Jesus denied himself. He denied his glory. He came to us. He denied himself for us. He was denied by others. He followed the will of the Father. He followed a group of soldiers up a hill. He followed all the way to the cross. He followed all the way to death and to the grave so that we might taste glory, that we might become like him. So real clear, respond. For you, it might be to dive in our dwell reading plan. Read the scriptures with us. And you can find a journal on your way out. We have them available. Grab one today. It's also online. You can, uh, you can jo- decide to join the church today. Again, what habit do you need to change? You don't need to be a homeless Christian. You, you have a family here. You can join today. Today's your day. And, and, and maybe for you, it's, it's sure enough. I'm going to decide to give. That everything I have is God. Is God's. And I'm, I'm going to give over to him. Maybe you need to decide to serve. I know that we have so many. I heard last week, we have so many preschoolers coming to our church. We, frankly, we have others that can be blessed by being with children and guiding them and leading them to the Lord. Become childlike, become like them. So follow him and pray that you will become like him. Devote this time, this season to the Lord. All right. So let's pray together and the team's going to come out. We're going to We're going to sing before we go. So Lord, we thank you so much uh, for this explicit call that you've placed on our lives, that you have given us yourself. And so now, Lord, we, we determine, I pray for every person here, that we give our lives over to you fully, not just to our lives over to a big story that makes sense or somehow to frame Uh, why we're even here on this planet, but we would focus on the person of Jesus. You are God in the flesh and you have died on the cross for us. And so Lord, in, in giving our lives to you, denying ourselves, we trade our old ways, our old habits for the new ways that you've called us into. We're trading all of our lives that we've prone to belief And we embrace the truth that you've brought to us in yourself. And so, Lord, may we never be the same again. So now we worship you. In your name we pray. Amen.